Hello, I'm Stefan, and in this edition of Tech Talk, we're going to show you exactly how to make custom control cables. Now, stock cables are great, and off-the-shelf cables work fine if you're just replacing something on a stock bike, but what do you do when stock just doesn't cut it? We're going to show you how to make your own custom cables that fit your bike exactly. We'll show you the best practice techniques that we've worked out, but also we'll show you a couple of grassroots tricks that can get the perfect cables for your project. So control cables have always been one of those things that I felt kind of trapped by or just sort of uh, stuck with. And even a simple change, as simple as just switching to a different set of handlebars, would mean that I'd spend hours trying to reroute and deal with trying to soak up the excess cable or try to find a special routing to make an extra inch or two or five to make up for the huge ape hangers that I put on, you know, whatever Ducati I thought ape hangers belonged on. So eventually I woke up and decided that I, I can change these stock cables. I can shorten, I can lengthen, I could make my own from scratch. And I took off on this adventure of figuring out, well, how the hell do we do that? Uh, first stop, YouTube, just like you. And I found a bunch of people that had videos out there that were extremely entertaining, very interesting and amusing, some peculiar vernacular and uh, clever ways to talk about different things. Somehow, most of those videos came from Canada. Who knew? But um, ultimately, they didn't produce the professional results that I expect, and I didn't feel comfortable with those in safety critical applications like throttles, brakes, and clutches. Oh wait, that's all of the control cables on a motorcycle. So after some practice, we felt like we had a process that was pretty well dialed, and we were able to put together a universal kit and some tools that make the job really quite easy. And for the kits, we worked with Vinhill. They've been producing control cable kits since the 70s, and they're known for making high quality components, and that was a logical choice for us to work with. Um, in this video, we're really only gonna focus on throttle cables, but the technique is really the same for clutch and brake cables, and we'll deal with those in a future video. So let's move on to what's in these throttle kits. We've got two kits. Uh, one of them has black housing, and guess what? It's got a black housing. The other one has stainless braided housing, and it has stainless braided housing. The rest of the kit is pretty similar. There's a few differences in the ferrules and some of the odds and ends, but we can get into those details in a minute. So both kits have some very similar components. You've got a outer housing and an inner wire and a bag of hardware. Same thing on the stainless. You've got a outer housing an inner wire and some hardware. Now we can get these bags out of the way and we can start out looking at this inner wire. Now there's a bunch of different types of inner wire. This is generally generically called uh, wire rope and stuff like that, but the details come into how the braid is actually constructed. These both use a seven by seven uh, braid and that means that there are seven individual cables that are wrapped up and then those Individual wrappings of seven cables are wrapped into another group of seven and that means that this cable is actually quite flexible You can see that the the bend radius is very small These are really soft and, and easy to manipulate and that's exactly what you're looking for in a uh, In a throttle cable, but now if you're looking at something like a brake or a clutch you're looking for stiffness so those additional strands can cause some problems and you don't want that small gauge wire, you need a larger wire, but we'll talk more in details about that. For now, just understand that you're looking for a seven by seven braid for a throttle cable. The higher load of brake and clutch applications need a slightly different inner wire. Now, the outer is a five millimeter OD for the black housing and a six millimeter OD for the stainless braided housing. Of course, that makes sense because the housings themselves are basically the same until you get to the covering and by adding the stainless braid and a plastic cover over the top, it adds an additional millimeter to the typical construction. The um, hardware bags are slightly different between the two kits and that's because the ferrules need to be sized correctly for the larger six millimeter wire and they need to be a little bit smaller for the five millimeter outer housing. And um, that's exactly what we've got here. 
So what's going on with these outer housings? The outer housing is comprised of a helically wound uh, square section steel, and that allows it to be flexible. So right, you can you can bend this around, and actually, surprisingly, the bend radius is is pretty small. That's that's not too bad. You can flex this, and it bounces right back. And hey, that's pretty cool. Then around the outside is the black coating that protects. Uh, the paint and everything else on your bike and also just gives us a generally appealing appearance and prevents rust and corrosion from happening. It's kind of the same thing on the stainless braid. Uh, this is just a little bit dressed up and if you've got a very um, custom bike you might want to go with the stainless braid. But that's just an aesthetic choice. The core, the structure, the, the root of the housing is the exact same and both of these have a Teflon inner liner and that makes the uh, cable very smooth and slippery as it goes through the outer conduit housing. So what do you do when you're ready to actually make your cables? The first thing that is uh, that I would suggest is you route the outer housing and that means that you will take this this conduit, this housing material and route this through the bike and you need to be paying attention to a few things, a couple of details like uh, you don't want any pinches. You don't want this to get smashed between the fork and the body. You don't want it to get smashed between the fork and the frame. Uh, you also want to make sure that when you turn the bars, this doesn't wrap around the steering neck and start to pull because if the housing gets pulled separate of the inner lining, uh, that's going to actuate throttle and you don't want that to happen. If you're going around a corner and you're turning your bars and all of a sudden the throttle jumps up because the cable binds, um, it's going to be pretty awkward. You'll probably have a involuntary dismount and everyone will laugh at you. So you don't want that. When you're setting up your routings, pay attention to that. The other thing that's really important is you don't want this to drape over something like the exhaust pipe um, or anything that's going to generate a lot of heat. Um, a drape over the back of the engine, not that big a deal. Yes, it'll get somewhat hot, but not hot enough to really cause a problem. It's really exhaust um, components, uh, headers, that type of stuff. Make sure this is not in contact with that. We may have already mentioned this, but it's worth just touching on again. There is a size difference between these two housings. The black is a five millimeter OD and the stainless braid is a six millimeter OD. That becomes relevant when you're dealing with the ferrules and um, fitting into any type of end components, the throttle housings or the um, adjuster screws on your carburetors, that type of stuff. So just something to be aware of. For the most part, everything still works out and it all fits, but you just need to make sure that you're aware that there is a size difference between these two. So once you've kind of worked out the, the rough routing for what your, your conduit housing is gonna need to do, uh, you'll wanna figure out what the ends are gonna be. And this is just kind of a planning thing before you start to cut. Um, and that brings us to this, this wonderful bag of hardware. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. There's actually a ton of stuff in here because we've tried to make this as complete and universal as possible. So this really does have just about any cable end that you would need, any ferrule end that you would need, adjusters, elbows, etc., even uh, a couple of little boots and stuff. There's actually so much in here that I'm not gonna cover it in detail, but this is detailed on our website, revivalcycles.com, and all of the bill of materials is in the, the listing. So if you really wanna make sure, it's already available for you. But at this point, we're really just trying to figure out which ferrules we need to, to cap the ends of our, um, our housing. And what's gonna determine that is what fits in your throttle housing. There's different OD diameters of the ferrules. There's some that have little uh, clip rings for uh, circlips to hold the, the cables into the housings. And that is gonna be determined by the exact throttle housing that you've got. We've even got just basic ordinary rounds that uh, you can crimp onto the housing and those fit into the throttles, no big deal. So once you've got your outer housing kind of worked out and you know which ferrule ends you wanna use, um, the next thing you wanna figure out is which of the cable ends, these are gonna go on the inner wire, which of these fit in the, the cam wheels for your, your carb assembly and which are going to fit into the um, throttle housing for your throttle assembly. And we've got a whole pile of them in here, uh, everything from little round spherical guys to barrels of various sizes and even just some basic uh, plugs that would be consistent with what you'd find on like a British carburetor or a VM carburetor from Makuni. So we've pretty much got you covered for just about anything you would need. There is one type of cable end that is particularly relevant and that is this one 
which has a flathead screw poking out of one end. And the nice part about this specific cable end is that you can put this together without doing any type of soldering. This is sort of the, the quick and easy way. This is, doesn't require any special tools. You basically just put everything together, um, cut to length, and then you tighten this up. And for most applications, that'll work just fine. Um, it's not exactly as permanent as we would like, and there is a risk that the throttle could, that the throttle cable could slip through this end fitting. Whereas if you've soldered this, there's no chance of that. So this is just a convenience and something that is very quick and easy. If you want to um, accept that risk of potentially you have a throttle cable slip later in time, okay, cool. This makes it very fast, but ultimately all of the correct solder ends are also available in this kit. So in addition to the cable ends and the housing ferrule ends, uh, there's also a few other things in this, in this hardware kit. Um, things like adjusters. So you've got a mid cable adjuster and that can be used to just put a cable length adjuster in the middle of the, of the housing. It's a really easy and convenient way to do it. Sometimes it's not as uh, aesthetically pleasing. You don't really want to have your cable adjusters hanging out in the breeze because they just don't look good and it's much better to have a clean run all the way through to the carb. And that's where this adjuster comes in. Uh, this works with most uh, Japanese style carburetor sort of cable attachments and it allows you to change the length of that housing really quickly because you'll never get the actual wire size cut exactly right and you just you need to maintain a little bit of adjustment. And the other thing that we've got included in the kit is a um, angled kind of piece. This is a way that you can make a fairly abrupt change in direction straight out of a carburetor or a throttle housing. And it's got a nice uh, Teflon liner in the middle of it so that you don't have a lot of drag, but it also allows you to get that nice tight bend radius that you wouldn't be able to get with just an ordinary housing. So pretty much we've got all the options for cable bits and parts and pieces. If your bike has a really specific um, hardware arrangement, it is fine to actually just pull those off of your old cables and reuse them in a new cable, uh, but typically you don't need to do that unless you have sort of some unusual or very specific um, cable ends. And for the most part, everything you need should be brand new and in this kit. So with your outer cable routing, uh, you're gonna end up needing to cut some of this off, hopefully. We've given you a meter and a half uh, or about 59 inches, and that should be enough for most applications for a throttle. In fact, that might be enough for two throttle cables in some applications that have very short cables, but generally, if you need a push-pull or a twin-pull cable, you're gonna need to get two kits. It's just, if you're lucky, you might be able to just eke out two kits out of this. We just wanted to make sure you had enough for all situations, even if you're running just ridiculous ape hangers. So, assuming, like you almost certainly would, that you need to shorten this, the way that I do it is just with an ordinary side cutter and you can get that in there and bam, just right through it. But when I did that, I smashed the shit out of this end and now it's all messed up and it's not really gonna let the cable run through it very smoothly. So to fix that, uh, easiest way is just to use a file and spend a little bit of time smoothing that out. Some movie magic will shorten this process for you and you're about to see like super fast forward. What I'm looking for on uh, this, this end finishing, I'm trying to get these, there's a helically wound uh, piece of steel that goes around this entire conduit and I'm trying to get the end of that so that it, it has a smooth finish all the way around and that supports it so that it doesn't try to kind of curl in and pinch the wire or flare out and lose uh, stiffness. This really is a way to kind of prevent the cable length from changing over time. And I really want to have a very flat end on this so that it doesn't have problems in the long term. And I can see that I've filed off a little bit of it, but I'm not quite there. I'm looking to get a nice clean all the way around and you'll see the small seam where the transition happens between the helix. So I'm not quite there, just a little bit further. So oh, there we go. We've got that nice clean uh, file look that goes all the way around and I can see just a small break uh, where it transitions from the helix, which of course you'll never get rid of that, but at least we've got a nice flat surface going all the way around and the inner housing is relatively clear and open to accept that cable. So done with the file. 
That gives you a nice housing length that is clean and ready to go on both ends. So you've done all your pre-planning, you know what uh, cable lens you need to interface with the throttle assembly, the carb assembly, you know what ferro lens you need for the outer housing to match up with the, the cable stops for your bike. And uh, in, in this demonstration, I'm gonna show you how to do this kind of the quick and easy way. And for this explanation, I'm gonna assume I need a, a elbow on one side and an adjuster on the other. So this would be the part that exits the throttle housing. This is the part that connects to the carburetor. And I'll show you how to do this the fast and easy way. So important thing, put your ferrules on first before really anything else. It's so easy to forget. It, it happens to me all the time. So I just start by putting those on because it makes it easier to not forget. Next, I'm going to thread on the inner wire end that is gonna fit with my uh, throttle assembly. And in this case, it's just this little small guy, but yours might be different. And this is just the one that I decided is gonna work for me. And I'll put that on so that the chamfer end is going towards the pre-soldered cable. And now I can just slide that all the way down to the stop. And holy cow, check that out. One end done. Now that will fit in my throttle assembly. And I've got this other end that is still ready to do whatever else I ask it to do. And that can be threaded through the ferrule. And the housing. run that guy all the way through. Of course, you would have yours cut to length and everything worked out. Just keep feeding that through and eventually it's gonna poke out the other side. All right, and there we go. Now that's poking out the other side and we can feed that through our other housing end. And then lastly, so at this point, you would actually go ahead and install your cable on the bike. So this end is poking out of the throttle. This end is mounted in the carburetor and you can trim to length your inner wire. So you're probably only gonna need a couple inches poking out this end. So side cutters, cut that thing off. And the last adjustment you need to make is to loosen that screw, slide this cable stop on, and then tighten up the screw again. And it is that easy. That's a throttle cable. You pull on this end, that end gets shorter and vice versa. Exactly the way a throttle cable is supposed to work. So that's the quick and dirty method. It will work fine. There's a risk that you might have a little bit of a slip here. Is that the end of the world? Probably not. If this was a brake or a clutch, uh, you really shouldn't do it this way. In fact, most of the time they won't produce, they don't allow, and we don't provide any uh, cable fittings that would be for those applications. And just don't try and do it this way. It's too risky. So what if you wanna do this a little bit more permanently or a little bit more professionally, a little less just kind of quick and dirty, get it done. All right, let's get rid of that fast adjuster uh, cable end. And now to do this with a solder joint, we're gonna need a few tools to make this right. Uh, first, we're gonna to have to actually cut our inner uh, wire and that can be done with basic side cutters. Just like that. Uh, we're also gonna need something that's called a bird cage tool. And that is this little guy right here. And now you can find this on revivalcycles.com. Uh, this is a really simple tool. It's just got a little pinch thing that goes in a vise, and then these three little punches that depending on which size you're working with, uh, you can smash this down and I'll show you exactly how it works right now. So we're gonna need a bench vise, and this goes in the vise, and then we want to, this is important, Make sure you put your cable end on first because after you birdcage or flare this, it's gonna be really hard to put the cable end on. So that needs to happen first. And now we're gonna go to the smallest hole, which is better to get from this side. 
And we want this to be set flush with the top of the tool, just like that. Snug that up. And now I'm gonna look at these guys and because we're on the smallest hole, we're gonna use the smallest punch and a hammer and whack. So what that did is it frayed out the end of this cable. So now mechanically, I can't really remove this. That is good, but that's still not really enough strength to, to support this joint. So now this has given us uh, some mechanical structure, but we're gonna add some solder to really just bring this thing home and make it a solid connection. Um, we're done with the birdcage tool, so that can go away. And at this point, we've got our cable ends, our ferrule ends, and everything is in place so we can solder this joint. And to do that, we're gonna use a solder pot. Now, a solder pot is pretty much exactly what you think it might be. It's a pot full of liquid solder. Well, liquid solder is really hot. Uh, it's made of metal, which means it's hot because metal generally is not liquid at uh, cool temperatures. And liquid metal is a bit dangerous. So there's a few things that you wanna pay attention to. The first is that safety glasses are a great idea. You're dealing with this kind of springy thing. And after you dip this in there, if for any reason you bump it and flick it, it could spray a bunch of molten metal in your eyes. And I don't know about you, but that sounds horrible. That sounds really, really, really unpleasant. So you don't wanna do that. Safety glasses, great idea. Also just be aware of the fact that you're working with molten metal. In order to get the molten metal to stick to the stuff we want it to stick to, we're gonna use something called flux. Um, this is a rosin flux, and this is a liquid rosin flux, which is a little easier to wet out the joint. So we can dip this in here, just enough to cover the uh, cable end and just a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of the wire. And then we carefully dip this in here. Now, the solder is a lead-based solder, and it's important to consider the fact that you're dealing with lead, but that smoke is all the result of the resin or the rosin uh, flux. So we're not here breathing liquid solder and that kind of molten or gaseous um, solder is a risk because it's lead based. It's uh, 6337 or 6040, some ratio of that between tin and lead. And lead is dangerous for lots of reasons. It makes you crazy. Um, but don't worry, because we're using a solder pot, we're not actually vaporizing the lead and all that smoke that just came out, that's just the rosin core solder, which is more or less tree, or tree sap. So nothing to concern about there. And that's it. We've got our cable end attached. It's still hot so it hasn't solidified yet. And it's hot enough that I don't want to touch it. And we end up with a very secure and complete connection between the cable end and the wire. Now, by using the solder pot, we don't have a lot of excess solder. We didn't really change the size of, that, size of that barrel. It'll still fit in our connections just fine. But if you do have a few stray wires or a little bit of extra solder sticking out, you can just come back with your file and knock those down to smooth them out. And that is a complete cable that you can now install on your motorcycle. And like all cables are really not very easy to demonstrate. But yeah, simple enough, it's just a throttle cable. So that is if you've got all the right materials. Now, if you don't, we've got a grassroots technique that's a little bit more homegrown and you can do with just some cheap stuff you grab from Home Depot um, and a pop torch. You will still need some flux and you'll still need some solder, um, but you can use basic plumbing solder Again, same thing you get at Home Depot, and this is kind of where the pace flux comes in. If you're a DIY guy, you've probably got this stuff kicking around in your garage. So move this out of the way, and we'll start getting set up to do the grassroots version of this. So bring our bench vise back in, and in all honesty, I've not actually tried this technique before, so we'll see how it goes. 
And all right, this, this is just an ordinary pipe cap. Uh, this is probably a dollar or maybe two dollars from your or from your you know home improvement center and All we're doing with it is just using it as a solder cup We're gonna put that in our bench vise and let it sit awkwardly there and we need a pop torch And I'll get that going While I go grab some solder now we get that set to start heating up our little pipe cap. And I'm gonna grab some solder. Need some more heat. Let's crank this thing up. Now back on that whole safety tip, uh, we are working with a lead-based solder, so that means uh, I'm going to wash my hands before I eat anything. It's not really an issue to handle uh, lead-based products. It's an issue if you ingest them. So. I know lead tastes really good and you know lead based paint chips are the, are the most flavorful but you really don't want to eat that crap because it will shorten your life and make you crazy. Just kind of melting this down again all that smoke and stuff that's just the the rosin uh, burning off it's not really not really dangerous or damaging because we're still staying below the temperatures that lead is an issue. But that whole temperature control thing is part of why I would recommend using a solder pot because they're just not that expensive. It's a lot easier than mucking around with all this nonsense and it maintains the temperature at the correct level um, whereas at this point I'm having to moderate and modulate to keep this from getting too hot. Keep adding a little bit more of this solder in there. I'm sure that there are other people out there that have different techniques for this, but like so many things, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. And this is just the way that I don't know. Works for us. Now, I am using an electrical solder uh, in this demonstration, which has a, a resin core, and that's not really ideal for loading a solder pot like this. It's also not really a big deal, but that's why you keep seeing some of the flames popping up. If you were using uh, like a plumber's solder, that won't. That'll be a solid solder, and it won't have that rosin core, and it won't tend to flame the same way. And really, for our purposes and what we're doing, it really doesn't make a lot of difference which one you're using. All right, that seems like it's a pretty good, pretty good bit of solder in that cap. So we can turn this down to a maintenance flame, just enough to keep it going, but not enough to get it crazy. And we can try this all again. Now, I mentioned I haven't done it this way before, but it seems easy enough, so you get to watch the, uh, the first tests. So we knock off that joint that we did the right way, and we'll grab another cable end. So we've got to do that whole birdcage operation, and to do that, we just want to fray a few of these ends and it isn't that important which tool you use to do it. I'm actually kind of just half-assing it with uh, some side cutters and trying to just press that end to get the little strands to fray out. A small needle nose pliers would probably be a better choice, but since this is the grassroots method, we use what we've got readily available. Just 
kind of mash some stuff together. All we're really trying to do, and if this was a brake cable, I'd take it a little bit more seriously, but as a throttle cable, it's not quite as critical. I really just want to kind of ball this up so it holds once the solder's in place. All right, that's kind of good enough, but not really as nice as it would be with the real bird cage tool. All right. Then the rest of this goes pretty much the same as before. We'll dip that in the resin or the rosin flux and then in it goes. And when we've got all the raw, the rosin flux burned off, we can remove it. Cool it off with our moist paper towel. And voila, that's the quick and dirty way to get this done. So we've covered the really easy way to do this, the right way to do this, and then the sort of right way to do this based on the materials and the tools that you've got readily available in your garage. But ultimately, the cable kit is all the parts and pieces that you could pretty much ever need to make a throttle cable. And in future videos, we're gonna be covering clutch cables and brake cables. Uh, but really the technique is virtually the same. It's just a few different components and a little bit larger housing and inner wire. All right, so that was more or less the do's or the kind of do's uh, for making throttle cables or control cables in general. Um, a couple of don'ts. And these were things that I learned the hard way. Uh, you don't want to directly heat the cable and try to get enough heat into the end of the cable to add solder directly to it. It's much better if you can heat the solder and get that solder bath hot enough to dip this into. Uh, if you heat the cable, you'll basically anneal the steel and that makes a specific spot where it really wants to break and that coincides with the location of the greatest stress and kind of movement right at the cable end. And that means it's gonna break right there, right where you kind of told it to. So don't heat the wire itself. That's the most common cause of uh, do-it-yourself cables uh, failing. The next one is make sure you're controlling your heat and you don't wanna get any heat into the outer housing. Uh, obviously there's a Teflon liner inside of here that doesn't wanna get hot. Uh, the outer jacket doesn't wanna get hot. So make sure you're keeping all of your heat away from the outer lining. And the last one and the most important and the easiest thing to do is don't forget to put your, all of your cable ends and everything together before you complete the soldering. Uh, even before you complete the birdcage. Double check, make sure, triple check, quadruple check, because it's super frustrating. You've gone through all this effort. You got your housing size just right. You got your inner wire size just right. You got one end done and it's just that last final step and you get it finished and you look up and you go, oh shit, there's my adjuster. And now you gotta start over. So don't do that. All right, so we've tried to put together a kit that has virtually any cable end that you would need, virtually any ferrule end that you would need, and enough components and parts and pieces that you can make a cable that will work on your bike, whether it's antique British stuff, whether it's modern sport bike stuff, whether it's um, vintage Honda Cafe Racer stuff, really this cable has all the hardware, the parts, the pieces, et cetera, that you need, and it's got the performance that you would expect from Revival Cycles. That uh, Teflon lining in the outer housing, uh, the seven by seven strand uh, inner cable, it makes for just a nice smooth operating uh, throttle cable. There are so many parts and pieces that we've uh, included that you've got plenty to practice with. And if this is the first time that you're making a cable, it's a pretty good chance that you're gonna make some mistakes, you're gonna screw up with your heats, so you're gonna forget to do something. So go ahead and use some of the spare parts that you don't need to practice and work out the kinks and the details. That might still leave you with um, some leftover parts and pieces. And if you're lucky, you could potentially get two cables out of a single kit. But our intention was for this to be a single cable kit um, with just plenty of spares for everyone else. And if you really can't stand having all those leftover parts, get creative. Arts and crafts times. Make a, a super cool uh, nerdy necklace for that special someone in your life made out of only throttle cable parts and pieces whatever works for you, or just store it in the bin and eventually someday it will become totally relevant. 
All right, so go to revivalcycles.com and you can find this kit as well as all the tools that we used in this demonstration, well, except for sort of these grassroots things that you can find at all of your home centers. Um, while you're there, you can find a bunch of other products that we use on all of our builds and that way you know that they work and they're the top quality things that you can find. Um, if you get bored waiting for the next installment of Tech Talk, you can always check out our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter feeds and you can keep up with what all the other ding-dongs that I work with every day are doing. Sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's boring, but you know, that's just life. So with that, I hope that this throttle kit uh, demonstration was useful for you and maybe you learned something. And if this got you one step closer to getting your project back on the road, that makes me extremely happy. So good luck, get, get to work and make yourself some new throttles. Thanks for watching.